Using machine learning to analyze your business data is the single best use case for Python and Excel. Yep, you heard me correctly. You can use machine learning to analyze data, to craft new insights, and to have more impact at work. Now, while I've been teaching folks machine learning skills for years now, I was super, super excited when I saw Python and Excel for the first time back in August of 2023, because I knew right then that Microsoft was making it ridiculously easy for any professional, maybe somebody like you, to build these advanced analytics skills and have more impact at work using data. In this video, I'm gonna cover the five best machine learning techniques for use with Python and Excel. These five techniques are useful to any professional, doesn't matter where you work, doesn't matter if you work in healthcare or government or finance, doesn't matter. These are the same five techniques that I use in my consulting practice with my clients, so you know it's the real deal. But before we can get into this list of the five techniques, we need a level set on the various forms of machine learning. As it turns out, there are multiple kinds of machine learning, but in practice, only two are most useful in the real world. First up is predictive models, and this is all the rage and has been for quite a while. So imagine, if you will, you have a website where you take in a claim of some kind. Let's say you're an insurance company, and people fill it in, and then you run that through a machine learning predictive model. And what it does is give it a score of whether or not it thinks this claim could be potentially fraudulent, yes or no. That's an example of predictive models, super useful, one of the most powerful, one of the most high return on investment things that you can do with data, even with the advent of ChatGPT and generative AI, for example. Most companies can still benefit tremendously from predictive models and do. Second type of machine learning is what's known as cluster analysis. And that's where you have a pile of data and the machine learning actually picks through the data and then sorts it and says, look, this, this particular piece of data goes in this group and this group and that group, that sort of thing. So it's all about clustering or grouping your data. Now that might not sound particularly exciting when you compare that to predictive models, but trust me, cluster analysis, the ability to group data is super, super useful. We'll talk more about that later on in the video. Not surprisingly, with Python and Excel, you have access to many predictive modeling techniques and many cluster analysis techniques. But don't get overwhelmed by that because in practice, you'll just need these five that I'm gonna go through in this video to start with. And I'm gonna actually go through them in order. I'm actually gonna give you a roadmap of which way to go through them to get the most results. Before we can do that, we need to just drill in a little bit on predictive models. So we have predictive models and cluster analysis. Those are our two types of machine learning. Within predictive models, we have two kinds of predictive models. The first kind of predictive model learns how to predict categories, what are known as labels. So that's things like true and false, approve and deny, legitimate versus fraudulent. Um, if you're trying to predict medals at the Olympics, bronze, silver, gold, notice that the things that we're trying to predict here are all distinct categories, you know, yes, no kinds of questions. The second kind of a predictive model predicts numeric quantities. So things like the price of a house, uh, the customer lifetime value, length of employee tenure, that sort of thing. So what we're going to see as we go through the five machine learning techniques, some of the techniques are about predicting categories or labels, and some of them are about predicting numbers, and some can do both. Now with that background, let's go ahead and jump into the list. First up, we're going to pop into Excel, and I'm going to talk about decision trees. So here I am in Excel. I've run some Python in Excel code and I've created a decision tree predictive machine learning model. This is the very first place that you should start on your machine learning journey with Python and Excel. And the reason for that is a couple fold. First up, interpreting and understanding decision trees, as long as they're not too big, is quite easy. You could literally put like, for example, this decision tree in a PowerPoint slide and show it to business stakeholders and they would kind of understand what's going on here. So that's the first thing. They're awesome for interpretability. Next up, Decision trees are exceedingly easy to learn how to use. Honestly, you do not have to be a math genius to actually learn how to effectively use decision trees with your business data to drive insights. And next up, and maybe the most important of all, decision trees are state of the art. Most machine learning, most advanced analytics is done using data in a tabular format. Think of a table in Excel, right? You got columns and rows. And decision trees time and time and again, and machine learning techniques based on decision trees have been shown to be by far the best, most useful with tabular data. So not only are they interpretable, not only are they easy to learn how to use effectively, but they're also the best for business data. So decision trees are the first place where you should start. Here's an example of a decision tree. You can train them in Python and Excel. You can build them, you can visualize them, and you can also derive from them in a lot of information about what's going on in your data. So if you're interested in learning more about decision trees, check out the description below this video. In the description, there'll be links 
to some free crash courses that I have on decision trees. And this way you can learn more. So this is technique number one, start with decision trees, learn how to use them effectively before moving on to the second thing, which is the mighty random forest. So the random forest is the second technique. You should learn this after decision trees. And it is a powerful technique. It is my go-to and has been for years in my real world analytics work back when I was an employee and for the past few years as an independent consultant. As you might infer from the name random forest, this particular machine learning technique is based on individual decision trees collection of them makes a forest. In machine learning terms, this is what's known as an ensemble. An ensemble is just a collection of other machine learning models all operating together to provide you with more power than a single model can give you. And ensembles based on decision trees are state of the art. All the best techniques that are commonly used in real world business analytics are based on decision trees. And the random forest is awesome. It's very easy to understand how it works. It's very easy to get it to work effectively with your data. So it makes it the second stop on your journey. One thing you need to know about decision trees and any machine learning tech technique based on decision trees is they can both predict categorical labels like yes, no, approve, deny, that sort of thing. And they can also learn how to predict numeric quantities like the price of a house. So decision tree machine learning techniques like the random forest are extremely useful, very flexible. Now here's the thing though. In the previous section, we saw how I could visualize an individual decision tree and we can look at it. And as long as it's not too big, it's pretty interpretable. When you use a random forest, you typically typically have 100 trees, 200 trees, 300 trees, that sort of thing. So visualizing it becomes basically a non-starter. So what we do instead is we ask the forest, essentially, hey, of the data that I gave you, of the data that you learn from to learn how to predict something, like a yes, no kind of question, which of the data is most important? And the way to think about it is, which of the columns in the table are actually most important for making quality predictions. And that's what's known as feature importance. And what we can see here is an example of this. And in this particular case, this machine learning model, this random forest model, was learning how to predict the income level of a US citizen based on various characteristics. And what it found was that the age column was by far the most important. I won't go into details of what this means, just know that this is the general feature importance, right? But this is an example of how you can start using things like a random forest to analyze your data, use feature importance to interpret what's going on with the model, and then you can report those results to your stakeholders. So number two on your journey should be the random forest. Start with the decision trees, use that information, use that knowledge, and that allows you to springboard into the mighty random forest where you get a lot more power than using a single decision tree. That's predictive models. So I'm telling you to go with predictive models first, two kinds of predictive models. Next up, we're actually going to add in a clustering algorithm because the combination of clustering and a predictive model ends up being super awesome. So number three, the third stop on your journey of learning machine learning techniques for Python and Excel is a clustering technique known as k-means. That's the name of the technique. And what k-means does, like all clustering techniques, is take a pile of your data and then organize it and say, look, all of these particular rows belong in this group and all these rows belong in another group, so on and so forth. And like I said before, on the surface, that doesn't sound super interesting, but hold on, let me explain to you how this is really useful. So what we've got here is some behavioral data so every row happens to be a customer of a grocery store chain, and each column happens to be something related to their characteristics of the customer or their purchasing patterns. And the idea is like, well, how can I actually extract some information from this, this collection of raw data? And the answer is, well, I can cluster them. I can say, look, how many of these customers are like other customers and put them in groups? And then I can start to analyze what characteristics they have in common. This is what's often known as segmentation, customer segmentation, very commonly used. Now this is grocery store data, but it could be anything. It could be insurance claims as your rows. It could be patients in the emergency room as your rows. It could be anything that you can think of. It could be devices if you're in supply chain. It doesn't really matter, right? So your rows are your things and the columns are the characteristics, and then you can group them. Let me flip over to the Python code here. And what you can see here is the results of doing my clustering. Let me scooch this over a little bit. So what I've done is I've taken that original data, run it through the k-means clustering algorithm. And what I get back is row by row, what cluster assignment? Now Python begins counting from zero. So zero means the first cluster, one means the second cluster, two means the third cluster, so on and so forth. And what you can see here is that this particular row was assigned to cluster zero, this particular row was assigned to cluster two, cluster one, cluster two, one, 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 so on and so forth. Now you might be thinking to yourself, geez Dave, big deal. Well, okay, so what we can do is we can say, look, let's take a look at how total food purchases relates to the cluster assignment to see if there's anything going on here. So I can highlight all the data and then scroll back up real quick 
And then I can ask Excel, hey, based on the cluster assignments and the total food purchases, recommend me a chart. And it says, hey, what about this scatter chart here? That's pretty good. So we'll just go ahead and pop that in and then make it a little bigger so you can see it. And what we can see here is the various cluster assignments are on the y-axis, right? Zero cluster, the one cluster, and the two cluster. But notice what's going on here. What we see here, each dot represents the total food purchases for each one of the folks by the cluster that they're in. And what this allows you to do is say, okay, look, cluster two is people that don't spend, compared to everybody else, they spend a very little amount of money. And then these people spend a lot more and these people spend even more yet. And notice that I'm only looking at one column of data vis-a-vis -vis the cluster assignment. When this becomes really super powerful is when you start thinking about multiple columns at the same time. And then that becomes really super powerful. That provides you a lot of insights into what's going on with your data. Now, if you're interested in learning more about K-means clustering, I have a free crash course. There's a link down down below in the description. You can go ahead and take that crash course if you'd like, and you can learn a little bit more about how K-means actually works behind the scenes. That is stop number three on your journey, K-means clustering. Next up, we're going to talk about a couple of old school techniques. And the first of these old school techniques is going to be logistic regression. So here I am in Python and Excel with a logistic regression model. And you can see here, there's a bunch of tasty goodness, but I can't go into that because we just don't have time. By the way, if you're interested in learning more about logistic regression, I do have a free crash course in the description below. There's a link to the crash course and you can go ahead and take that if you're interested in learning more about logistic regression. But let's talk about what logistic regression is at a high level. It is a predictive modeling technique where the outcome of interest happens to be a yes, no situation. This particular model here that I'm showing on the screen happens to be obtained from healthcare data, where the outcome of interest is whether or not a particular patient had heart disease, yes or no. And logistic regression models are awesome because they are highly interpretable. That's why you primarily use them for data analysis. And let me show you what I mean by that. So down here is the interpretability. So for example, in this data set, the logistic regression model said, look, if a patient is designated as being male in the data set, then the model found that they are six times more likely about 6.2 times more likely to have heart disease than somebody who does not. Now that is highly interpretable. That is very understandable to a broad audience. That's part of the power of logistic regression models. Now you might be asking yourself, geez, David, then why is this number four on the list? And the answer is as powerful and as useful as logistic regression models are, they make a lot of assumptions about the nature of your data. Think about decision trees or compare them to decision trees and decision tree-based models. Decision trees and decision tree-based models make no assumptions about your data whatsoever. So there are a lot easier for you to use when you first get started compared to something like logistic regression. But it's super useful, which is why it's on the list, but that's why it's in the fourth position. By the way, just so you know, you may find that once you learn decision trees and random forests, you don't need anything else. And that's totally cool. So logistic regression is here when you need it, but don't necessarily jump into it right away. Concentrate on those first three before you get to logistic regression. Lastly, we're going to cover the granddaddy of all predictive models. And that is what is known as ordinary least squares linear regression, or more commonly referred to as linear regression. So linear regression is a predictive modeling technique where the outcome of interest is some, soon, some sort of numeric quantity. So for example, how price of a house, or in the case of this particular predictive model, it's trying to predict the quality of a red wine based on other characteristics like acidity and sugar and alcohol content, that sort of thing. Linear regression is the granddaddy of predictive modeling techniques. It's been around for more than 200 years, and it has been used to analyze data for that entire period of time. Linear regression is like logistic regression insofar as it produces models that are highly interpretable. They have a lot going for them in terms of being able to communicate clearly to your stakeholders what's going on in your data sets. For example, this particular model is trying to predict the quality score from a range of zero to 10. And what we can see here is that these coefficient values kind of tell you what's going on in the data, what the model found in the data. For example, the higher the level of residual sugar, the worse the quality score is. So there's a negative relationship as opposed to, for example, alcohol. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, the higher the level of alcohol, the higher the quality score, because notice that this coefficient value is positive. And then we could talk about the individual values and what they mean, but that's well beyond the scope of this video. But just know that in general, like logistic regression, 
Linear regression is very, very powerful in terms of producing models that are easily interpreted by your business stakeholders. I also like logistic regression. Linear regression makes a lot of assumptions about your data. Before you can actually hang your hat, before you can trust any sort of findings that your linear regression model produces, you have to verify that all of your data meets the constraints because if it doesn't, you're kind of dead in the water. So this is linear regression. This is the reason why it's on number five on the list. Not only because it makes a lot of assumptions about your data, but it's also the most complicated of all the techniques that we've seen so far to use effectively. It's waiting here for you when you need it. But like I said before, you may get away with just using decision trees and random forests and other decision tree based techniques. And you might not ever need linear regression and that's totally okay. There you have it, my five top machine learning techniques that allows you to make the most out of Python and Excel. Make no mistake, Python and Excel is all about empowering professionals like you with advanced analytics so that you can achieve more at work using data. Now, if you're interested in learning more about machine learning, then check out my free machine learning crash courses below this video in the description. Next time, what I'm gonna be talking about are my top data visualizations using Python and Excel. I'm talking about visualizations that are difficult or just not possible to do in out-of-the-box Excel. So you might wanna use these in your analyses instead of just trying to rely exclusively on Excel-based charts. So that video will be coming up. It'll show up here on the screen as a tile. And in the meantime, until that video is ready, what I'll do is I'll put up another one of my videos that shows you how you can take k-means clustering and combine it with decision trees to analyze data, which is really super powerful technique I've used many, many times in my career. Until next time, please stay healthy, and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.